I hope everybody is here. Challenging, let's begin. Um, welcome to the PID webinar. My name is Nadim al -Haq. I um, I hope that you will have fun joining us on this very interesting webinar today. We're going to look at the at the ride hailing services, the Ubers and the Kareems. So let's look at the socioeconomic impact of ride hailing, overcoming barriers to mobility. Okay, now let's see if Kareem and Uber are doing that or are they not? Uh, so here we have with us a very good panel from uh, people who are associated with the business. But first, Fatma Akhtar Ahmed, uh, she's a director um, in Kareem, director of uh, government relations. Then we got Ibrahim Mana, managing director, global markets Kareem. Then we got Suzanne Nathrali, head of uh, um, policy, Middle East and North Africa for uh, Uber. And then we got Rana Bakas Anwar, additional district magistrate, Islamabad. Well, I think the best place to begin is to ask Fatma to tell us, uh, or Ibrahim, whichever one of you like, to tell us what uh, Kareem and Uber are now once. So we don't need to distinguish between them. Uh, can you tell us? the experience of Kareem and Uber in Pakistan and how you're making it better for Pakistan and how is it that you claim it's overcoming uh, uh, the socioeconomic barriers in the country and providing more mobility options. So I trust Ibrahim or Fatma, whichever one of you like to take the lead. Let's begin. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Madeem. This is um, in, uh, definitely a great platform to talk about this. I think that it's very important that tech-related uh, disruptions like Kareem and Uber, it's important that we're part of a wider discussion around the kind of impact we've had. So just to, I'll just give a brief overview and then Ibrahim can um, add just to begin with, um, Kareem has been in Pakistan for around five years now. And this includes uh, having a registered captain base of about 800,000 with customers around 900, uh, more than 9 million uh, with rides, which would be approximately around 236 million rides have been taken on the Kareem platform. And I think one of the biggest impact, if I have to just sum it up in one light, is, is it how it has majorly enhanced mobility, especially in the cities for men and also most importantly for the women. 36% um, uh, of our customer base is our females. So that's an extremely important statistic to kind of bear in mind as we talk about the impact mobility can have and how mobility can enhance socioeconomic productivity for the people of Pakistan. I'll hand it over to Ibrahim now to kind of give a more sort of global perspective on this and uh, hear his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. Uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. It's great to be here. I've actually pre like uh, prepared a few slides that I would like to present if we have the time that has a few numbers that can help us all uh, understand the kind of impact that Kareem has, uh, has managed to achieve during the couple of years, uh, in the past couple of years. Do we have time? Can I, can I do that? Go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. All right, one second, let me just share this. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir, we can. We can, there. yes. Go ahead. All right. So, you know, we've done this study with uh, Oxford Economics. Um, independently, they came up with this uh, socioeconomic impact of uh, Kareem in Pakistan. So key findings, you know, we've uh, actually invested around $100 million uh, in Pakistan. There are two elements uh, to where this uh, investment went, right? One is captain and one is customer. So let me start with the first, uh, first threshold. So for captains, we have managed to achieve uh, having eight, 800,000 captains registered. 15 of them, 15% uh, of them 
uh, said that they were unemployed before Kareem and Kareem providing them with an income generating opportunity. There are 9% of captains worked as traditional taxi uh, drivers before Kareem. 7% of captains joined from other ride hailing companies. And, you know, as for demography, 53% uh, you know, spend uh, less than one year. The age uh, is around uh, below, uh, below 40 uh, years old, uh, around 77% of our demography of captains, and 90% of them are male. 27% uh, of them actually finished their metric uh, qualification, and 42% are university uh, graduates with a bachelor's degree. We have managed to achieve 236 million trips with our captains, 2.2 billion kilometers crossed. Uh, and you know, without our captains, the backbone of this whole operation, this wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be able to achieve this, right? So on the impact that we have provided customers, we have 9 million registered customers that have done 236 million rides. Uh, as for gender, 64% uh, are male, 36% are female. One uh, interesting fact that we have found through all of the markets that we are in, that a lot of our female uh, users uh, sometimes register through their brothers and husbands. Uh, so take this with a pinch of salt, uh, this might not be super accurate. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying our best to raising the bar for safety, and this is a key priority for us. And there's a slide that I'll go through uh, as well uh, later on, just to show you what we're doing. You know, we do understand that there's a big responsibility on us to make sure that uh, our sisters are in this region are able to move uh, in a safe manner. So we are focusing a lot on making sure that Kareem is the safest uh, mode of transportation for our female, uh, for our female customers and for our female captains as well. So again, like 3.3 million women across Pakistan have moved with Kareem. Uh, they have taken around 20 million rides uh, in Kareem. And a number that I'm very proud of, and I wish that this number actually improves, and we're working very closely with our teams on the ground. We have 1,586 female registered captains with us uh, that are working to provide for their families through uh, through Kelly. So the way that we look at uh, safety is that there's a definitely a tech element to it. So there's an in-app safety features that needs to be there. There needs to be boots on the ground um, and there needs to be an inspection of the car. And also there needs to be a rigorous uh, safety background check on, on captains, right? So we are working uh, very closely uh, with different agencies to ensure that we are doing uh, background checks on all captains uh, through NADRA and through police records. We are also uh, looking after criminal background checks for all active vehicles as well. Um, you know, all of our captains are screened and undergo uh, LIA criminal background checks as well. And then, you know, for the car inspection, we have worked closely with OLX Motors to ensure that each car that gets registered in Kareem gets inspected. And then after it gets to Kareem, uh, there are random checks. Uh, and at the same time, if there's any complaint, we do check the car again as well, uh, based on the ratings of customers. And we do have boots on the ground. So we're working very closely with Mohafiz. We do have a safety and security team as well based in Pakistan that work 24 seven uh, on managing any situation that happens on the ground that is considered an emergency. We do have all the rescue emergencies and hospitals mapped out. And you know, there's uh, FIRs as well to be logged against any foul play. This, uh, you know, there's, again, this is the operational bit of it, but there's a lot of features in the app where we, added the safety button there we've added call masking so 
uh, your number cannot be revealed uh, to, to anyone, and then you can call through a different routing mechanism. There is right, uh, right tracking uh, feature where you can actually share the link with any of your friends and family uh, as well to add a, like one more element of safety. We have an in-ride insurance for both captains and customers in case Allah Allah something happens. And then we do have a dedicated 24 seven safety hotline. So yeah, that's, that's about it. I just wanted to share uh, those elements with you just to give you a sense of uh, the socioeconomic that Kareem has provided. And at the same time, some of the things that we are doing for our female uh, captains and customers and the safety measures that we are taking. Thank you. Let me. Rahim, one quick question before we go ahead. What is the mobility on your drivers? I mean, in the sense that how many, what turnover do you have among your drivers? What is the satisfaction level on your drivers? Because I frequently find that they may not be making enough money on Kareem. Are they making enough money? Are they making a living better than another occupation? Yeah, excellent question. Um, look, we, we have to take one step back and look at the situation that we are all in, right? Uh, after COVID, uh, so during COVID, you know, like uh, everything was disrupted, including our business, or especially our business and the tourism uh, as well, industry, aviation industry, anything that has to do with mobility. And, you know, it was a tough two years, uh, still is, uh, we haven't fully recovered yet. Uh, and a lot of our captains got impacted. And due to the lack of uh, demand or lack of people taking rides back then, whether, you know, for like for valid reasons, some people fear their, uh, like for their safety in general because of COVID or there was restrictions in the market uh, by the government to ensure that people are safe. Uh, so that demand naturally reduced. And a lot of our captains, you know, this is one of their livelihoods and they depend on it. Uh, and once that demand wasn't there, they had to look for other opportunities in order for them to provide for their families. And, you know, as many industries in the world now we're, we're, we're witnessing something which we call a V recovery, where you have something that drops and then bounces almost immediately. Uh, and we are seeing a big bounce back when it comes to uh, demand. But unfortunately, you know, supply takes time in order for us to be able to ramp up. And we do have a, we do need a lead time in order for us to actually ramp up uh, the supply situation, which unfortunately, because of the, sometimes the imbalances that happens in the marketplace between supply and demand, a lot of our captains find themselves having to drive for longer longer, uh, longer distances uh, for them to reach the pickup area. So we do have to make sure that we do have enough captains and we're working day and night ensuring that we add more captains to the platform to ensure that there's the right balance there in order for all of the economics for captains and the price for customers make sense and both parties are actually happy. I hope I answered your question. Uh, a brief follow-up, uh, just to understand uh, what kind of an option a Kareem, a Kareem job is, because remember, there's a big debate, even in advanced countries, that this employment, although yes, you can choose your hours, you can choose your the amount of time you want to spend working, but it comes with just absolutely no benefits at all. There's no uh, job security, there's no uh, stability of income and there's no additional benefits like, for example, healthcare or life insurance, or something or pension, things like that. Um, so overall, if we look at the Kareem occupation and we compare it to, let's say, a government job, which people love to get here, a government job, for example, if a guy gets a driver's job with the government, would probably end up making about 20, 30,000 rupees, but with benefits, it's uh, Uh, and long-term fees in your months, maybe even more. Would Kareem compare with that as an occupation? Yeah, so look, to be honest, uh, and to be very clear, we don't look at it as an occupation. We do look at it as a 
income generating opportunity where people have the flexibility in order for them to earn uh, and work as much as, as they need, right? So we do find a lot of our captains do have two different jobs where they actually depend on a certain job and then they would actually bridge it through working at Kareem or actually working through Kareem but having the flexibility to actually doing something else that they wanna that they wanna do. And we do have a big portion of our captains who are full timers, right? Uh, to be honest, uh, Nadim, uh, sometimes, you know, you hear those complaints from people who are uh, working for two to three hours uh, per day. And we do need to make sure that when we do compare these uh, jobs or, or uh, opportunities, we do actually compare them apple to apple, right? Like same number of hours, same like conditions. And, you know, like we do care a lot about our captains. We are working very closely with different agencies to ensure that they're safe. We do ensure that uh, we do have insurance and right insurance to ensure that if anything happens, we do cover uh, cover them and cover the like passengers in the car uh, as well. So I, I do understand that it doesn't, like when you compare it to a traditional uh, government job, like you're, you're, you're uh, referring to it, maybe, it maybe does not uh, compare, but I think this is a different mode of basically uh, earning and it has a different circumstances and have a different, uh, different considerations to it versus comparing it to a regular job. Maybe if I can add here as well, um, just to what Ibrahim has been saying, what we see with the drivers on the platform is they actually put a very high premium on this element of flexibility. And the fact of the matter is that when you look at the labor market across the world, to date it has been very black and white. Either you're an employee or you're an independent contractor and there's like nothing in between. And the advent of platforms and platform work um, has really created a new area when we look at gig work and where the world is going. And, you know, I think this is something that is a responsibility for many countries to start to look at, to say, look, you know, because people are, are working on platforms, yes, they don't have the basic protections and what have you, but I think maybe it's also like an opportunity to be able to have a conversation to say, well, do we need to now look at the labor laws? Do we now need to look at the work environments so that there are ways to provide basic protections for workers that operate on such platforms. Um, but in any case, also like Ibrahim has said, for both Uber and Kareem, this is something that we well recognize and we both invest in insurance programs to make sure that drivers are at least covered in case of injury and things like that. But it certainly is a gap and you know we acknowledge that. And I think it's something that it's not only the responsibility of the platforms to work on, but something for governments as well to have a look at. Ben, I think that's a good answer. But let me turn to you now and ask you, since you're the director of Uber in uh, Middle East, North Africa, um, what are your plans going forward in terms of expanding the service? Because right now the service for, in uh, my experience in Pakistan, although I must say I've moved to Uber in Nigeria, Guinea, Tanzania, so, Prefer. I thought there was somebody who, was, um, who had some information on me rather than take a traditional taxi, although I felt bad about it. The, the, the traditional taxis are kind of suffering, but nevertheless, it's a good convenient um, uh, you know, service to have out there. But now in Pakistan, yes, um, Uber Kareem is available, but only in big cities. And even in big cities, rightly so, the drivers prefer to go to areas where, uh, you know, obviously they can get a return service. So they don't like to go out into the suburbs and things like that. Um, what are your plans going forward uh, in terms of expanding the service? Huh? Is it, and uh, also there's a new van service here, which is called Swivel, uh, which is just putting forward vans. And you also have a ride sharing option. Uh, so how do you see yourself competing in this market and going forward, spreading the and the, the Kareem and Uber service throughout the poorer areas or will it just remain in the richer areas? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think at the moment, Uber is present in nine of the major cities around Pakistan. Um, and there are no immediate plans, as far as I'm aware, to expand into other cities, although going into smaller cities would definitely be something that's on the horizon. I think something that we're really trying to focus on now is the recovery post-COVID um, and making sure that we can get the operations and earnings for drivers in the cities in which we operate back to where they need to be. Um, there's certainly a lot of scope for expansion into small cities. And even if you look at the product base that we have, a lot of it is focused around low cost options. So for example, we've got seven products across multiple areas, including Uber Go, Uber Mini, Uber X, Uber Moto, Auto, Delivery, Uber by the Hour. And so the idea here is really to combine the convenient transport and economic opportunities to multitudes of people in, in Pakistan. Um, and, you know, at the heart of it, it's, it's really about how we can bring mobility as a service to everyone everywhere. Um, and so I think the first focus, like I said, is making sure that we can we concentrate on recovery in the cities in which we operate and then using these low cost modes I think that will be the way that we think about expanding into smaller cities um, I love that you brought the example up of swivel I think you know looking at higher capacity vehicle modes and ride hailing is really where everyone will need to be moving towards the future if we're looking to have sustainable um, you know, modes of transport and operations. I think at the end of the day, the more people you can get into a single vehicle, you know, this is really what will be the game changer. Um, and so we are experimenting with high capacity modes. For example, we have an Uber bus product in Egypt. Um, we are also looking at in various places around the world, partnerships with transit where it doesn't have to be you know, Uber or Kareem having the high capacity vehicle on the app, but we can partner with others, we can partner with government that have those transit modes or the bus modes that are already existing and use our technology to add a layer in order to make it more efficient. Um, so that's certainly many of the areas that we'll be looking into for the future. Let's turn to the government. Rana Sab, Rana Vakas, traditional DC of Islamabad. Rana sir, what's your take? How comfortable are you with Uber and Kareem? What's the government's view? What's the government's view? Uh, yeah. And uh, I must also point out, Rana sir, that for decades, people like me have been arguing that the government has failed in a major way by not being able to develop a taxi service in Pakistan. And now Uber and Kareem have done it. And they've shown us that it is possible. The government couldn't do it. But we'll come to that later. First, what's your view? How do you see yourself dealing with it? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Nadeem, uh, for this wonderful discussion. Uh, I can talk on behalf of Islamabad uh, administration. And uh, we do have some concerns. Uh, the one major concern is uh, the rate of tax which Uber and Kareem are paying to the uh, Islamabad administration uh, under the motor vehicle ordinance. And uh, the other concern is about the congestion uh, Uber and Kareem are causing on Islamabad, on the roads of Islamabad. Uh, so these are two major externalities uh, and these are negative externality, ex externalities. Uh, we are not talking about the positive impacts or the corporate culture which the Kareem or the Uber has introduced for the, their captains or the drivers or any social security net they have introduced. Uh, that is their obligation. But as far as uh, we are concerned with the tax they are paying to the government, uh, that is abysmally low. Uh, so I have figures where they are, uh, uh, the tax we charge them, uh, that comes up uh, for Punjab, they are paying almost 0 0.06 rupees per person per year. Uh, when we take those figures to the population of Islamabad and the amount of tax or the fee they have paid. And then for Islamabad, uh, although we charge them more than what they were being charged uh, in, Islam in Punjab, but still uh, Uber and Kareem had reservations on uh, the incidence of tax. So uh, the amount of congestion they, they are introducing 
the uh, amount of external externalities they are causing the uh, tax vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the tax they are going to pay is quite low and we are much concerned with that uh, the other thing is the uh, uh, there's no study or though there's no measure that how much congestion the uber and kareem has caused in islamabad uh, so we would also like to see in coming days that uh, we start working with either pied or kazim university to calculate the exact congestion because uh, there are for certain studies in uh, uh, LA in US where they have calculated that the congestion caused by Kareem uh, or uh, the congestion caused, caused by Lyft and Uber uh, in one state was 62% more than the counterfactual and the counterfactual was 22%. So it is an established fact that Kareem and Uber or Lyft or any ride hailing app is going to cause congestion on the streets. Uh, so as a regulator or as uh, administration, we would like to see what positive externalities you are going to bring in or what measures you are going to take to decrease the impact of those externalities. Uh, these externalities like congestion also impact the socioeconomic condition. It adds to the stress. And there's a lot of literature on that, that traffic congestion adds to the, uh, the, uh, 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 the congestion has psychological impact on the people. So uh, I would like to see that what Uber and Kareem has to say uh, to these points. And then uh, we can see further that. Um. Mr. Nadim, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to uh, share a... Absolutely. Example. I'm sorry we seem to have lost Manasab. I will bring him back. Why don't you go ahead and respond? And I'm sure he, his connection will get better. Manasab, can you hear us? Sure, sure. Manasab, can you hear us? Okay, go ahead, Ibrahim. Answer those, yeah. So we do have a YouTube example that happened in the United Arab Emirates, in Dubai <laughs> specifically, where... We've actually partnered with the company, with the, with the government to bring on uh, taxis on the platform of Kareem. So we do work very closely with RTA, which is the regulator, uh, re regulator in UAE to bring their taxis into the platform. We've created a joint venture called Hala, uh, which is now one of the primary mode of transport in uh, UAE. This is a great example of when like private sector and public sector comes together, puts the right work frame and actually are able to uh, work for, you know, for serving, for serving the people uh, of the, of the country. So well, yeah, just, just connect to, Sorry, please watch. we do look forward to uh, basically being able to engage in such conversations, hopefully in Pakistan and, and help. Um, just to add on Ibrahim's point, I think one of the key things that Kareem has done over the past few years is work with governments, provincial governments, including ICT, and work on a regulatory framework, and I, which includes a very uh, a licensing fee as well. And I think one of the key uh, one of the key concerns regarding uh, Kareem and Uber, I think that's where we talk about why there's need, why need to be regulated, and why we need like a regulatory framework which encompasses all these points. As far as taxation is concerned or congestion is concerned, yes, I think our like the figures we quoted earlier in the socioeconomic impact, we've only been around for the past few years. So I think moving forward, these are important points. These are valid points, sustainability, climate change. These are all concerns that uh, we are definitely um, uh, working on as well. Um, and we should have more studies on this and urban planning. I mean, I, I live in Islamabad and I more than congestion, I feel our road network is something which also needs to be sort of considered uh, when we talk about congestion. So a lot, again, it's an entire ecosystem. Just looking at ride hailing as, as one thing, I think we just need to kind of step back and take a more encompassing view on, on this. And as far as taxation is concerned, um, we work with provincial governments, we work with ICT, the applicable sales taxes that we give. But yes, we can we can have a conversation around this, just, you know. 
I think just to add to what uh, Fatima is saying, you know, what we see around the world is that actually ride hailing takes up a very, very small percentage of the actual like trips that happen on the road. What you tend to see is the major causes of congestion is people using private cars. And what we really try and promote is ride hailing as a preferred mode over people using their private cars, because not only do they use their cars to go to and from the city, but they also take up a lot of space in, uh, in parking. Um, and so it's a really inefficient use of, like it's a really inefficient land use, right? Um, and so, you know, when we talk about things that government can do, in fact, to make cities more smart, we often really focus on saying, look, how can we work together to even encourage people to use ride hailing more than taking their private cars? How can we add those technology layers onto public transport to help to make them more efficient so that we can get more people using single forms of transport? Um, so, you know, I think the congestion piece while there are studies that have come up elsewhere in the world, I think particularly when we look at Pakistan, um, this is something that we would certainly want to look much closer at because my sense is very much that uh, it's it's not the ride hailing that's causing the congestion, but it's very much you know the the use of private cars on the road. Um, so this is certainly something that ride hailing would be in a position to help ameliorate um, to quite a great extent. And just to add, uh, uh, I, I don't know the exact figure, but there's this recent news as well that the um, cars purchased by Pakistanis, uh, there's been a surge in that as well. So I think, again, I think taking a systemic view on this, and yes, I do think uh, a study on it, uh, doing more research on it, and then coming up with recommendations would definitely be sort of the way forward on this to truly establish what, what, what is causing this congestion. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Rana Vakasa, we lost you there. Do you want to take it up again? Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I have a bit of unstable connection. Uh, mm -hmm. We do appreciate that uh, there are so many things going on and even there are considerations that uh, regarding the climate change also uh, electric mm -hmm. vehicles are coming, uh, not in Pakistan, but uh, there's a trend going on. Uh, but the important thing is that the ride hailing is not driven by the demand, but it is by the uh, by the driver who wants to earn for that particular ride hailing uh, app, who wants to earn through that ride hailing app. So the people, uh, what we, we can call that is the dead heading. That heading means that people are roaming on the roads and they want to be in the network of that ride hailing app. And then they are contributing to the congestion. So I would be looking, I would be suggesting that there should be a mechanism within the right hailing apps uh, where they can address this concern that only a specific- My friend, uh, they... hello. Hi. Hello, yeah. So there's a- Go ahead, Rana go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so my concern is that uh, as a regulator that there is, is there any limit which Uber or Kareem put on their uh, captains that there's a, there's a one peak number of captains that, that are going to be on the road at one particular time. And that limit should be, uh, should not be rigid. It, it can be flexible. It can be dynamic uh, based on the peak time, peak hours or demand or anything. If Uber is charging its customer uh, peak uh, it's applying a peak charges to the customer, why they are not paying that similar kind of tax to the government that they are contributing to the peak hours or they are contributing further to the congestion. So my only concerns are regarding the internal arrangement within Uber or the Kareem that what regulation they are going to introduce so that we as regulators do not have to further intervene. Um, just to quickly um, answer that um, uh, about the electric vehicles and all, I, I mean, I would like to take this moment to mention that Pakistan actually has an electric vehicle policy, which is, which is fantastic, right? But again, uh, we have the policy, but the infrastructure, the ecosystem, that's all missing. So we can talk about electric vehicles and we could, can talk about that's in the pipeline. But right now, do we have charging stations for them in different cities? 
Um, do we have all the prerequisites in place? So I think that those, those as much as these are conversations that we are doing groundwork for, but in the near future, it's, it's a, a lot of the onus lies on developing that uh, basic ecosystem as well. Um, so I think that's um, extremely sort of important to kind of put into perspective. Um, and just as Suzanne said that ours is a very small percentage of the cars on the road. Um, there are, and, I, and yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I thought you were Go about. ahead, no, no, it's, it's fine. Please continue. No, no, I, I wanted to explain the peak factor or the surge factor as well in order for us to understand how this works, right? Because the street can, take, like the, in theory, the street can be empty and you can still have a peak. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with like congestion, right? It has the, there is, a, there is an imbalance between supply and demand and you're trying to incentivize supply to actually come to the platform and you're trying to actually push demand down in order for it to change its habits and actually take a different timing for their trip. Uh, if they if they're looking for a cheaper or more affordable price, right? So technically, peak does actually help whenever there's a congestion in the street by actually pushing more people back from ordering and like basically getting captains to where they need to be. But a four a.m. for example, you can have peak because there's no one in the street. Uh, including captains and the street is empty, right? Uh, so it has nothing to do with congestion, to be honest. At the point, we understand that. First, Fatma, Pakistan has no electric vehicle policy. They keep talking about it, but they never make it. I don't think you'll get electric vehicles this century. Might get it next century. One on the you... internet, which I will share with you, by the, led by uh, the Ministry of Climate Change. I know, I know they put it out, but... So let's leave that alone for a moment. It's not policy on cars together. And uh, Ranasap, I think um, if I think about it right, uh, Uber and Kareem should be relieving congestion. They are fulfilling a demand that the government could never fulfill, the demand for taxis, which I always had. Um, my friends always had it. Now I use Uber and Kareem all the time. So all the time. I'm in favor of but uh, let me just come to this. Rana Sab, you're talking about taxation. What do you mean by taxation? Okay, sales tax is one thing. Otherwise, yes, of course, Uber and Green will pay a tax on their profit. They'll pay a corporate income tax. They'll pay all those things. What other kind of taxation should they be paying for? Secondly, um, if the drivers are roaming around looking for a bride, well, we should have taxi drivers doing that. Uh, what's wrong with that? There should be more taxes in the street of Islamabad, uh, which we haven't had ever. I mean, should the streets be reserved only for the rich land cruiser owners or should the streets be shared by all of us? Rana Sab, over to you. Yeah, uh, so coming to the point, uh, one of the discussion, uh, you did mention that all the uh, ride hailing apps are supposed to relieve the congestion. Yeah, there, there are two, con two conditions for that. Uh, one is that uh, if there's a ride splitting, uh, uh, like if three people, they decide to sit in one car, then it is going to relieve congestion because you are uh, optimizing, you are, uh, uh, you are putting that car to the, its best use. Every seat is occupied. So this is one thing, but uh, I have no understanding or no data that how many people use uh, the split share uh, or, uh, or the split ride or similar features. The other thing is that if your the uh, Uber or ride hailing app is going to uh, drop you at a transitory point where the other person or the rider can avail uh, the uh, bus transit system or similar services that are available in a mass transit system uh, that are available in a city. So th there's a lapse on the part of the government that there has to be a network of mass transit system in the cities. That are, and then Uber and the Kareem, they can play a role where they can plug the gaps, where people find that they need to be dropped to a uh, mass transit system, bus station or similar thing. The other thing is that uh, the, uh, I'm not talking about the taxes, which they are already paying. 
uh, and they are required by the law. I'm talking about the licensing uh, regime, which is prevalent and the amount of licenses they are paying. So in the motor vehicle ordinance, there's no provision for a ride hailing app and there's no specific amount of the tax. The normal taxi driver, we charge them 1500 rupees for the license where they can go and they can uh, just ply on the roads. This is one thing. So based on that, the Uber and the Kareem, they were given a certain amount of uh, taxes, a certain amount of fee for the licenses, which they they were resisting to pay. Uh, they, they had their own version and the administration had, has its own version. One thing. The other thing is about the taxi drivers who uh, are regulated under the motor vehicle ordinance. They do not ply on the roads 24 seven because in their opinion, they optimize themselves by having their own adas where they are placing their taxis. So they stay at one place, people come to the, people go to them and people uh, get the right. There are inefficiencies in that system. Uh, there's no, no saying that uh, that is the best alternate to the Uber or Kareem. But those taxi drivers, they are important stakeholders. They are part of the systems and they are also resisting to the, uh, uh, to the arrival of Uber and Kareem since the day one uh, uh, in Islamabad. So we have seen that uh, these stakeholders, they must have been taken on board. There were concerns. And another important regulation which we uh, have for the taxi drivers is the fitness of the vehicle. So the taxi driver who gets licensed to drive a taxi complies with all the provisions of motor vehicle ordinance, but the Uber driver does not comply. So Uber must have internal mechanism for that, but uh, we are in talk with the Uber and Kareem. There are certain amendments which they have proposed and we are looking after that. So there are a few things which are being developed on this, but uh, to say this thing that all the Uber or the Kareem, they help in uh, uh, reducing congestion is very specialized case, which I have already shared that in case that it is for the mass transit system or it is a uh, split uh, ride. Uh, th these are only two things where they can uh, help in reducing congestion. The other, uh, the other use cases are against this. Um, just very quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Nadeem, I'm just going to, um, I think that yes, current motor vehicle ordinance does not account for um, ride hailing platforms, but that's what we've been actually pushing for for the past uh, three years with the ICT uh, government as well, to come up with a regulatory framework, which includes vehicle fitness, which includes uh, route permits, which includes a licensing fee. So just to, um, I think that this is extremely important. And I think this is where platforms like by can really facilitate this discussion and in, in sort of clarifying some of these uh, assumptions, so to say. The second thing is that we've only been around for a few years. And to be very honest, we are still in terms of profitability. That is something that um, uh, once we it's it's done, to, we are paying sales tax as well right now. So I think these, these are conversations which um, we sh they are relevant, but at the point at this point, I think that to answer most of your questions, I think this is why a regulatory framework is needed because it encompasses all of this. And we as industry, we are self-regulated, which and maybe a, a lot of other new players in the industry are not. And, and we see that already happening in the space out there. There are a lot of apps out there. We don't know if their regulatory mechanisms or self-regulatory mechanism are as thorough as ours are. So I think that we cannot, um, in, in, in isolation, even about the even the point on the taxation, we pay applicable taxes. We proactively engage with the government to uh, to to uh, on the regulatory policy, which has a lot of which has licensing fee. In fact, the ICT one is also something we are uh, talking with the ministry, relevant ministry in this regard. Yeah. I don't understand what you mean by. 
I don't understand what you mean by regulatory framework. What sort of regulatory framework should so, there be? So the governments, they've been um, the motor vehicle ordinances and amendment for it, which accounts for the ride hailing platforms. And mm -hmm. they, uh, as Rana Saab mentioned, how taxis are liable to comply with this framework. Similarly, those there are there are um, clauses in that framework, which uh, which include vehicle fitness, which more or less covers this along with some of the unique things that the sort of the business um, operates in. So those amendments are in process and, and we are working very closely with, with Punjab on this, KP as well, Sindh as well, even ICT and, and sort of pushing them to get, get, to get this sort of amendment passed and this law should come into force now. So this is something that um, we feel is required because I think what, what a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of this conversation, I think once the framework's in place, I think that uh, it'll be very, even for the government, it, they'll actually kind of see how we are, we are complying because we're complying already, but a lot of this is our own self sort of regulatory mechanisms. So once we have these frameworks in place, I think that um, a lot of these concerns, which, which would be sort of, which are raised as well, which would be addressed. And even from I'm the state- afraid, I'm afraid, Fatma, I'm, I'm a little suspicious of that, this, this framework. Because this, all this framework is going to do, if you're going to look at fitness of vehicles and things like that, it's just going to drive the taxis out of business. And Kareem will obviously get a huge advantage out of that. Whatever taxis there are, those taxis, in fact, we have, my biggest complaint, Fatma, my biggest complaint over the years is the government has never developed a framework for the taxi business in this country. It's the biggest failure of this country, which gave you a huge edge here. The government was unable to develop a framework for taxis. They were unable to develop a metering system. They were unable to develop taxi stands. They were unable to do any of the business things that the taxi business could have. They started a yellow cab scheme way back in 1996, 97 and never developed the rest of the scheme. So that taxi cab scheme became a scam. Now, the other thing which is also interesting is the government in its infinite wisdom has allowed Uber and Kareem to merge, which for competitive, from a competitive point of view should not have been allowed because now there's no competition, you are a monopoly. And now if you get to make- a There is competition. Uh, in fact, really? quite a lot of this space has really come up. I feel right hailing has really come up in Pakistan. Also, mm -hmm. I think that the models which Ibrahim spoke about, like in Dubai, where we saw the Hala cab coming onto the Kareem platform. I think this is what we should be really looking at. And I feel like these kind of synergies and partnerships can actually benefit both parties. And, I, and that's really what our vision at Kareem is as well. And I think that, uh, I mean, tourism is one example. I mean, one of the findings that we found in our report is the number, sort of uh, the top, top three reasons why people use Kareem, one of them was to see new places. And I feel that has such a strong correlation with tourism. And if we're able to provide a safe a safety and we're able to provide dignity as well in, in, mobile, in transportation, I think the opportunities are immense, but we kind of, I feel we really need to have that approach to it, you know, where we sort of look at ride hailing or these platforms as enablers you know, rather um, as, as one I'm all in all that, okay, this is, this is what's wrong with this business. I think there's a lot to unpack here and a lot, but a lot of opportunities to kind of build uh, products together. Fair enough, I appreciate that. So Ibrahim, where is can your competition? I just jump into? Yeah, so where is Sorry, your competition? Man. Please tell us. Yeah, so uh, Nadeem, just a quick observation, you know, like we're partners in this, right? Uh, I don't, there's like, I want to make sure that we understand that at the end of the day, like some of the numbers that I have shared, those are like great outcomes. And we're like barely scratching the surface, to be honest. Like if you ask me today, are we, are we like 1%? I think we're less than 1% of whatever trips are happening in the country. So like barely scratch the surface and that's the result that we got, right? Imagine if we get more support and, and, and what kind of support are we asking for? We're asking to actually get a law where we actually become governed and we all play within the same rules, right? And we, we, we are not objecting to, to this. We're actually offering a helping hand 
in order for us to actually becoming regulated as an industry, similar to how it happened in the rest of the region, right? Kareem, Kareem, actually one of the first countries that we've started in was Pakistan, right? We were in UAE, Saudi, and then Pakistan. And, you know, like most of the countries that we are in in the Middle East are already, were already regulated. So we are looking forward for this, uh, for this to happen. We are looking forward, similar to what happened in other markets, for us to actually work hand in hand with government to actually ensure that we are the subject matter expert here, right? Like we can actually help not only on the ride hailing, but like even transport, right? We have many examples in countries where taxis are thriving through our platform, uh, like uh, by, by accepting rides through Kareem and even Uber, right? So uh, I just want to make sure that, that we, like we understand that the success of Kareem uh, does not mean that it should come at the expense of taxis. Taxis can definitely be part of this. And, you know, users today, uh, they do want that convenience, right? They do want that basically a kind of service. They want that kind of convenience where they click a button and a car shows up uh, in front of their house or their work. Uh, so let's not forget the customer element into this uh, as well. It's not only captains and government. There's a big impact on users and, and, and citizens of Pakistan who are actually preferring these type of methods. No, look, there's no question about it. As I told you, I personally like Kareem and Uber. I've been using them a lot everywhere. And for me, it's a freedom that I can enjoy. For um, You know, I don't need a car. I don't need to worry about hotel cars. I don't need to worry about other things. And even if I'm stuck somewhere, I can call a service depending on where it is. But so, so I personally agree with you there. But at the same time, I might also tell you that we are working. We just agreed to work with... <clears throat> CDA in Islamabad to develop a car policy in Pakistan in, in Islamabad, which is, I think, the order of the day. What we need is to, first the operation of a car. Ibrahim, Pakistan, despite Lahore being larger than New York, larger than London, Lahore is 15 million people, London and New York are about eight or nine million people. We have no car policy whatsoever. I can park my car wherever I like in the middle of the street on top of the street or wherever, there is no par car parking policy. There is no car usage policy whatsoever. I can drive my car wherever I like. There is no car usage policy. I can ride into the middle of a congestion and honk my horn and go wherever I like. So we are developing a car policy with, with the, the CDA. And inshallah, we'll show you something in a month or two, because I think that's the first order of day. Congestion is ca caused by the fact that we have no car policy whatsoever. And drivers can drive whichever way they like without cost. And that's why they cause congestion all over the place. Uh, so let's not just blame Uber and Kareem. Congestion is the fact that rich, spoiled rich brats, right? I'm sure you can see that in your own country. Spoiled rich brats in land cruisers, they're the guys who cause, cause congestion and they're subsidized. They're not, they're not penalized, they're subsidized. So we will work on that policy soon. But let me take a question now. Um, Usman Kadir, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, yes, my name is Usman. I'm a researcher at Pi. Uh, my question is for uh, Kareem. Uh, there are some new services coming up. For example, there's InDriver, which is offering, uh, you know, um, rides where you can uh, offer your own rate based on what's going, uh, the, the going rate in the market. So uh, how do you uh, see yourself competing with that? Because uh, the Kareem captains that I've talked to have offered to take me on in driver rather than Kareem because they say they get a better deal through in driver. So how would you be competing with services like that? That's my question. Sure. Thank you. Great example of where the regu regulatory framework is not here, right? Uh, basically, what's happening is that unfortunately, because there's no there's no law that governs such companies, is that anyone can come in and do whatever they want and they can create such a big imbalance in the market. And guess what? Today, some of these companies will not serve, will not actually uh, impose any service fee or anything uh, as they are investing at the beginning of their journey into growth. But that what will happen is that that will soon be different 
and then they create that imbalance and you know it, it just doesn't create an equal playing level field uh, for all uh, companies where we are for example paying sales tax and i haven't heard of the other competitors paying such a such a tax so i just want to make sure that with such regulatory frameworks that we are all equal in order for us to be able to compete in a in a fair competition rather for us to actually be penalized because we're paying taxes or actually following the law okay zainul abdin Uh, hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Zen, and I'm a student of PIDE. Uh, actually, I've done research on accessibility of public transport to disabled persons, and uh, I found that uh, from the respondents, disabled respondents, that the Uber and Kareem services, like, they face a lot of difficulties while accessing these services. First of all, uh, the, dry, the captains of these services actually refuse to, to take the ride of disabled persons because of the fact that uh, they believe that their wheelchair would damage their car and uh, ultimately then they you know go for taxis which are on the road like uh, they have junglas uh, on it so i want to ask a question like do you have any policy which uh, actually facilitates uh, disabled persons and uh, do you have any policy like uh, not to refuse uh, you know disabled person at, and i think there should be an you know a separate Ape on okay. it, like uh, let's 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 let them answer it. Who wants to take that question? Fatma Ibrahim Sizan, who wants to take that question? Yeah, I can definitely take it. Look, uh, every person has a right to move, right? Uh, and that's why we were uh, we're in business. We want to make sure that we move people from point A to B in a secure and safe manner. Mm -hmm. So, I thought it's common sense to accept disabled. Uh, person, uh, if if that requires a policy, then we'll put a policy in place. Uh, let's make sure that we reinforce this with our captains and make sure that no one is refused uh, to take a ride uh, based on their uh, disability, right? So again, if this is happening, my apologies, uh, we will rectify this as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that's a that's a great call out, and uh, and you know I think it's perhaps an area that we can do a lot more education because I think even with captains, you know, like you said, of being afraid of how the wheelchair will damage the car, just even simple things like how to fold up a wheelchair, how to store it in the boot, those kinds of things, are certainly pieces of education that we can that we can provide. Um, so thank you for raising that. I think it's something we can certainly look at. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, folks, any other questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'll call you in. Uh, let me just raise another question, uh, Rana Saab. Um, in terms of congestion, what is the government, I know I told you we are working with CD on this, but what are you people doing about consumption? Uh, sorry, congestion. Uh, sir, uh, you already know there's certain, and although, in your opinion, these projects are of no use, uh, but still we are uh, expanding our roads, we are building bridges, we are building underpasses, and we are diverting traffic from uh, outside the city so that uh, the, there's no specific congestion on one particular road. Uh, but the, then again, th this is what we are uh, discussing for past uh, so many days also in various meetings also that the people are coming to the centers, uh, business centers in Islamabad, and they're coming mm -hmm. from far-flung areas, and even the ride-hailing apps, they are, people are using to come to these areas. So they are contributing congestion on time, off time, uh, even it's holidays, it's even it's uh, 1 uh, a.m. in the night. So mm -hmm. we are working, we are uh, doing our best. If PIDE has any solution to this, then uh, we are happy to uh, collaborate with PIDE. So we will, inshallah, come up with some started talking to the chairman. We will do something on that. But Rizwan Sab, go ahead, your question. Rizwan Sab. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Nadeem, sir. Uh, just want to clarify this uh, Rana Vakasa, what he was referencing from LA. This uh, ride-hailing uh, service uh, contribution to congestion 
you can only consider this when you have a supply on public transport side. We have almost zero supply, even in Islamabad, except the BRT, there is nothing. So that's out of question right now. And regarding the Kareem, uh, if you want to expand your network, uh, you may need to think uh, about the service, which is not only dependent on the uh, Android app. Uh, if you, I'm just coming out of a, a workshop to serve the elderly people. So if you want to expand your base, you like you said Hala service in Dubai. So if you can give that sort of option to people. Second is uh, there is a big market for commuting women. And I got to know this uh, from my wife who is also working. And she said there is a debate on, on the social media about the women who are using the motorbike, which is either provided by Kareem or other platforms. So if now uh, I can see on the streets, women are also riding the motorbikes. So if you can like bring in this thing uh, in your motorbike service that pink bikes or the motorbikes which are uh, ridden by or driven by the women. So there is a big number of, uh, you know, big significant portion of our population who can be your users as well. So that's one of my suggestions for you. Thank you, that's, that's a wonderful suggestion, I think that um, I think uh, when it comes to bikes and women mobility, I think he's excellent points. And this is something we're already working with, but because of cultural reasons or the shock factor, as they call it, this is something which is, is which I think women uh, as captains also struggle with. But rest assured, I think we've made a note of this. And this is, uh, I mean, we've had programs where we've partnered with organizations like Women on Wheels, uh, which was with Salman Sufi's foundation and excellent learnings. However, unfortunately, uh, well, these, these programs to be scaled up again, it, it's a supply and demand thing. But rest assured, uh, this is something we are extremely committed to that not only making ride hailing a safe experience for women as customers, but also women as captains. So thank you for that. So, That's a great point. Let me, let me ask you, Suzanne, um, how can we make um, sorry, let's step back a little. Susan, how, what do you mean by, by a regulatory framework? I see, I mean, I, I'm basically, let me put it this way, I'm anti-regulation. Can you please convince me that we need a regulatory framework, Susan? Susan, and then I'll come to Ibrahim. Convince me we need a regulatory framework. Why do we need a regulatory framework? I think the regulatory framework essentially is just to create clarity and to reduce those gray areas, right? Like I think we have a lot of tension with the taxis, with other forms of transport, because there aren't clear rules, there aren't clear guidance. Um, as we've you know, also heard from, from Rana Saab, you know, there's questions around like money owed to the government, licensing fees, all of these sorts of things. And so while we are very pro-regulation, I think the regulation also needs to be very balanced because we need to have regulations that can create a framework that allows for effective competition, that allows for the market to grow. And especially when you start to look at you know, things like technology that are evolving at a very fast pace, you can't tell what kind of business models and what's happening today and how that looks like tomorrow and the day after and the day after. So I think regulation is very important in order to have that kind of clarity, but there's a fine line between regulation and over-regulation. Um, so I don't know if, I don't know if I've convinced you, but we are big proponents of having clarity wherever we can. Okay, go ahead, Ibrahim. Yeah, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll pass this to Fatima since she is in the office trying to make it happen. I <laughs> think the view here is in the long term, regulate regulation also protects businesses. You know, it it it's it's something that gives us confidence that, and I think that's extremely important. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's, as Suzanne spoke about the balance between being overly regulated um, at the risk of the regulation being, let's say, business prohibitive. I think that's the that's the balance that needs to be struck. I think the other thing which in Pakistan, I, I feel we need to really sort of talk about is harmonized regulation because we I understand both taking amendment, it, it's it's every province, their complexities. But I think for a biz, for businesses, it's become extremely important because 
you know, in our business, we move between provinces. So it's extremely important that we, you have the harmonized regulation as well. And especially with, with uh, I mean, our sort of tech-related businesses, I think that um, regulation needs to be progressive. It needs to kind of account for these disruptions. So there's a lot of learning here. And I, and, and, but what, what I would like to mention is that this, uh, the governments have been extremely forthcoming in this regard. And they are willing to listen. They are willing to learn. And I think that that's a good sign. But yes, it, it's a process. It, it, it comes with its fair share of ch um, challenges and back and forth. But I think overall, it, 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 it's, it, it's kind of, in our context, I think it's, it's, it's something that will um, benefit all stakeholders. Give me an idea of the kind of uh, of the kind of issues that you want to raise, or the points that you want to raise in the regulatory framework. What 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 needs to be put in the regulatory framework? Just give me two or three points. Yeah, I think just having you know sort of putting a method to it that having. Yes. Uh, practices in place where are uh, uh, sort of things in place uh, or rules in place which everybody complies to. You see, in our business no, of mobility, what rules, what, what rules would you like to put in place? I think, quite so frankly, I think, yeah. I think third party I, checks, captain verification, these are all things that we are we are doing. Oh, we don't know if competition is going to be doing that. So it's extremely important to um, uh, vehicle fitness. I mean, these things are extremely um, important in, in the business of mobility because they could be serious consequences if they're not if they're not adhered to. So I think that as we see the rise of the rise of this space and and which at which has its pros, but at the same time to ensure that people are getting um, from every platform, they're getting the basic minimum safety and security uh, protocols. I think it's important that this regulation come in place. But shouldn't we leave I mean, it up? Me, the... Go ahead. And I mean, just to give you a small example, right? Like very easy for us to get a captain today and register him in like literally five seconds, right? And add him to the platform and he starts working. It takes us a couple of days in order for us to complete all of what Fatima was talking about in terms of like making sure that we're like compliant, uh, like uh, and the safety aspect to it, having like uh, a valid driving license, uh, having ensuring that the car is fit and all of these things, background check, uh, criminal background check. We honestly, we honestly don't know if others are doing that, right? And given that there's no regulation that's actually ensuring that everyone is actually doing it. It is putting us at a disadvantage because we're self-regulated and we are ensuring that these things are, are happening because we do want to offer a, a reliable, safe service for everyone. And that should be the right of everyone. But just a small example of how these things can actually act as a disadvantage if they're not there. But Ibrahim, I am, I, as I said, when I was in Nigeria and Kenya where it was uh, relatively unsafe, to move around, I took Uber primarily because I felt safer. So it was my consumer preference that I took Uber. I would have taken something else that offered me, even at a premium that offered me safety. So yes, we leave it up to the consumer to decide what they want to do. Uh, and I think consumers are fairly capable of wondering, of, of deciding which service offers them better service. So do we need do we need a regulatory framework or do we need to let the marketplace decide that, okay, if your competitor comes in and I they get a bad reputation, then obviously I'm not going to use them. Many people are not going to use them. Right now, even my daughter who's sitting in London uses Uber all the time. Um, you know, so hey, you know, consumers, consumers know and can discriminate between services. So let the consumers decide, why do we need a regulation for it? Uh, I think the regulatory framework is something that I said, I need convincing because too many markets have been killed by regulatory framework and regulatory framework always ends up being a bureaucratic thing rather than a well thought out thing. So that, that's the reason why I need some convincing. Um, so go ahead, anybody, anybody wants to answer that? Love to take it. Yes, just a few thoughts on it, Dr. Nadeem. I actually, in this case, I feel it's been um, it's been pretty exhaustive on behalf of the governments. I mean, they've had multiple consultations with just industry to understand how the model works. They have tried to come up with a regulation. I, I mean, I was just in KP. I mean, their 
that is sort of applicable for the next so many years for new entrants to come in. And when we talk about carpooling, when we talk about all these all these points that maybe that are relevant, I think the framework does look at it. So I have to say as much as yes, you are right, it can kill a sort of, it's not necessarily uh, very, um, I mean, free markets make sense, but at the same time, I think that there is merit to in this space, for it to be regulated. I think that that's something which, uh, it's a great regulation, which has sort of come around after extensive consultations and it's not business prohibitives thus far uh, that, uh, that they've been extremely, um, I mean, like I'm saying, the kind, the amount of consultations that have been held, it's it's pretty encouraging. So, I mean, who's to say? But I think that in the long term, it's 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 something which protects the customer, and you may you may be able to make a call between different platforms and choose the safer one, but not that's not something that will be a given with a lot of the customers. So I think that at the baseline, we should have some rules in place. But my um, replete with with examples of markets that have been killed in the name of the poor consumer. I mean, starting off from the telephone market, which is killed in the name of the poor consumer, starting off with the, with the public transport system in the US that was killed in the name of the consumer, starting off with the, um, with the now, um, you know, um, uh, there's so many ma markets that have been killed by the regulation. You said this, this framework has been made in consultation. Who are the, who are the people consulted and who made the framework? So this has been led by the transport department of various provinces. And um, in that, um, actually, they, if they've sat down with industry, with all the players, they've had a back and forth with them. They've studied uh, models that are working in different other in countries in the West, in the Middle East. And they've tried to, and at the same time, you know, it's something which they're also sort of doing. So there is a learning curve here. So yeah, I think that this once this does come into practice, there there may be a, a bit of back and forth on this as well. But I think that um, I think overall it is something that. Um, but I still haven't got clarity. Transport department, which transport department? There is no federal transport department. There are many transport. Oh, so it's with the provinces. The provinces. Yeah. So we, with the KP transport. Who are the key um, stakeholders that they consulted? So they consulted um, in, in terms of uh, industry, they consulted industry, they consulted the local um, administration, they consulted their own um, uh, sort of cabinet. This has, in some cases, it has gone multiple times in the cabinet and come back. So there's been a lot of back and forth on this. So it's jo process to head to get the law passed. I think they, it's, it's in that process which they're doing it. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea on this? I'm really worried. Rana Sab, do you have any idea on this? Nadeem, uh, just one second, if, if you don't mind. I'm going to have to uh, excuse myself. Uh, Please. Absolutely. We've been over 15 minutes. Apologies. I have to run to the next call. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's a pleasure meeting you. If you come to Pakistan, let us know. We'll I would love together. to meet you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And Rana Sab, can you please tell us on this thing, uh, this, this framework? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, I had some uh, problem. Can you repeat the question? Rana sahab, you carrying that there is a framework uh, for regulation of ride hailing um, that is available, that has been developed by the transport um, um, departments. I don't know who has developed it. Nobody's asked PAD or any of the other agencies to look at it. No university has looked at it. And yet this framework is going to come up as a law um, I find that quite remarkable. None of the consumers are in it. Uh, is this is this is this done? What's the deal of this? Can we review it before it becomes law? Can all yeah. the universities look at it? Uh, I would also love to review that. Uh, uh, I am also uh, I have no idea that if that framework has been developed and uh, nor I was consulted or Islamabad administration was consulted. Uh, but we did uh, find some amendments proposed by Uber and uh, Kareem uh, for the motor vehicle ordinance. And if they call those amendments as framework, 
uh, then uh, what can I say on that? Uh, but uh, there are certain amendments uh, which are under process in uh, Islamabad. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. Well, let's hope, uh, Saba Anwar, can you please try and look into it and see if you can find this framework? And let's see if we can try and uh, analyze this because it's very interesting. These frameworks that creep up slowly on us without us knowing anything at all, with no economic analysis, with no consumer analysis. Suddenly you have a law which kind of sets us back by 20 years. So let's let's look into that. Fatma, if you have a copy, can you let us have it? Um, I unfortunately don't, but I think Rana Saab should be able to because we've collaborated very closely with uh, even um, the, 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 we had a recent consultation on this as well, which was led by the transport department. So I'm sure we don't have a copy of it, uh, but I, I think, we, yes, sorry. Okay, which transport department has been leading it so that we can get in touch with them? So it's the Secretary Transport, ITA Islam. So I think she. Oh, well, she Secretary Transport Islam. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, just ITA. just intervening that we have we have received their amendment proposed amendments because we wanted to take all the stakeholders on board. Uh, mm -hmm. So we did ask uh, Uber and Kareem to submit their proposals. They have submitted their proposals. We had meeting in Ministry of Interior. Uh, for recommending those amendments or their proposed amendments, uh, but there was a disagreement. So we cannot okay. call that uh, a framework, okay. but we are in uh, active talks with Uber and Kari. Uh, we are engaging them. We are in process and we want to have all stakeholders on board before proposing any amendment. And certainly if there are any institutions involved, including the law and justice division under the rules of business, we would uh, like to get their input also. Asab, let me just state that we, the consumers who use these services, I use them almost every uh, week, twice or thrice. We should also be part of the stakeholder. My, my, uh, some of my colleagues ride Uber or Kareem every day into work. So they should, I mean, Usman Kader, for example, rides it every day. So uh, twice a day, in fact. So quite frankly, I think we should also be a part of the consultation process. The consumers are always left out of it. I know, Fatma, you know, this is the famous thing that's done all the time is that they make a car policy. And yes, a car that, policy. That's an, yeah, Nadeem said that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, we would like to bring you, bring consumers on board through exactly. PIDE. We can request yeah. PIDE to engage the other stakeholders and let's yeah. sort it out. Yeah, good idea. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, fair enough. So any other questions, folks? Or otherwise, I'll go back for closing to Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, any closing thoughts? Uh, just to thank everyone for this great conversation. I think, uh, you know, regulations in particular is quite, uh, has been quite a sensitive topic and it's something that we've been working on for many years. So it's great to hear all the perspectives and especially, you know, yours, uh, Dr. Huck, just in understanding where that balance needs to be between having regulation and having that free market. Um, but otherwise, really, really happy. And uh, thank you for having me and look forward to having future conversations with everyone here. Thank you. Uh, as I said to Ibrahim, visit Pakistan, please. We'll welcome you as a guest. Um, uh, Fatwa, any last thank words? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Firstly, thank you. I think it's extremely important to have these conversations. I think that it'll be a win if we, even from a reg regulation perspective, that we have inclusive regulations where a multitude of stakeholders sort of um, are consulted. So I think that's an interesting point which you sort of raised. And I think that one of the biggest, um, this, this conversation has been extremely, um, it's, it's, it's multitude of perspectives have come up, especially the disabled one. I think that's, that's such a good point that I'm taking away from this conversation to kind of look into and have a policy if it's already not in place. Also regarding women mobility. So excellent insights. Uh, once again, thank you so much for hosting this. This, this was great. We're available for any conversations you would like to have in this about in this regard moving forward as well. Happy to contribute. So thank you. Rasab, over to you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you. Very, thank you.
thank you very much uh, nadeem sahab and uh, fatma over kareem and uh, everybody who participated uh, we do look forward to uh, further engage all the stakeholders including kareem and uber they are important part of the ecosystem and we would love to see a good ride hailing services provided in islamabad a good mass transit system and we would love to provide great services to the citizens of islamabad to the residents of islamabad and we would also like to bring pied on board uh, who have arranged this uh, webinar who have brought everybody on board we would like to see everybody coming to make things better thank you very much nadeem sir thank you thank you all thank you ibrahim thank you suzan thank you uh, fatima and thank you rana sir we do this regularly because we feel it's important for us to understand the economy and buy it as the leading think tank of the country our role is to try and get as much good policy into the country for the benefit of the consumer for the benefit of the people and that's why sometimes we end up taking a bit of a critical role of the government and other things too but to be to be fair kareem and uber have done a great job in pakistan as i said i am a big user of uber and it allows me to free up my car it allows me to free myself up from the tension of driving i mean that's for me let me tell you the most important thing is to free myself from the tension of driving so i am quite happy to take uber and kareem and i am quite happy to to be able to discipline the driver i give ratings all the time if the driver hasn't driven well if he drives too fast i give him a bad rating i use that very carefully because i want a safe service for myself and my daughters i tell them to take uber and kareem because hey i have i feel that there is something somebody watching so so yeah i rely on you to provide that safe service so i'm very happy with that and as i said we rana sab also knows uh we are very keen to see congestion removed in pakistan but our feeling is it has to be done through parking and car use policies and not necessarily trying to um you know stop uh, services in fact kareem and uber should be allowing us to res uh, resolve the congestion issue and i'm hoping for you to innovate further into carpooling into um, i know you're trying but we may need van hailing or something we need some other thing but i leave the product development to you um certainly we will try and help you develop the market as much as possible we need more cars off the road and more people using such services and more people um what should i say sharing in fact i would welcome the day when i don't need to buy a car in fact when i was in the states i actually sold one of my cars to be able to take uber because i felt that i was just carrying an extra load uh, and i used uber as a as a as a substitute for my car for many months and i was quite happy doing that in fact i ended up when i did the calculation i saved money by selling my car and riding uber because uh, after you put together my, you know the costs of maintaining the car the costs of buying the car etc sometimes it's use it cheaper to use these services and lots of people have reached that conclusion uh, so there it is so folks thank you we shall continue our conversation all the best to you and i thank uber and kareem for joining us all the best good bye thank you very much everyone thank you